Our interview this morning is with Christopher Anthony Smith, alias Smitty. Uh, Smitty was born in Dallas, Texas, March of 1971. Served in the U.S. Army uh, years 2004 through 2007. Highest rank attained was an E-4 specialist. This interview was conducted at Burleson, Texas on Friday, October the 29th, year 2010. My name is Dale Dexheimer. I'm not related to Smitty in any way. Also in the room is Milton Gibson, who is our videographer. This interview is conducted for the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress and for Operation Remember, City of Burleson, Texas. With that, Chris, you can tell us your story. Um, my uh, uh, granddaddy was uh, uh, an infantry soldier. Uh, I haven't seen his records, but I saw a picture of him, and he was wearing a, a blue cord on his right shoulder, and, and what I didn't know at the time was a CIB over here wearing his glass class A's. Um, uh, wanted to kind of emulate him, so uh, I joined the Army uh, originally in 1989. Um, I went into the uh, uh, 10th Mountain Division and, uh, well, first went to Fort Benning, Georgia for basic and AIT, and then on, off to Fort Drum, New York for the 10th Mountain Division. Uh, Charlie Company, 2nd 22nd Infantry. Um, uh, back then, there were very few infantry soldiers with CIBs on their, on their uh, BDUs, on their uniforms. It was very rare to see. And when you did see them, they were uh, either Vietnam vets that were much higher ranking or, in my case, uh, or one of my mentors, uh, uh, Staff Sergeant uh, Ranger Donato Sanaseri, he had a CIB and, and uh, we all just wanted to be like him. And, uh, at 10th Mountain, uh, when I was there, that's where I learned how to, uh, the ways of the light infantry, you know, how to shoot, move, and communicate, and air assault operations, and uh, mount training, uh, military operations on urban terrain. We'd go to Fort Bragg uh, to do a lot of force on force against them, against the 82nd, and to use their mount operation uh, uh, training facility. Uh, went to jungle school, uh, down in Panama there. Uh, our booby traps and all kinds of cool jump jungle operations there. Uh, even did a very rare deployment to uh, Scotland where we stayed at Redford Barracks uh, in Edinburgh, Scotland. Uh, learned the, uh, the Brits way of, of doing things, uh, which is really cool. Uh, uh, trained really, really, really hard in, in everything. Uh, but I was young, I was you know, 18, 19, and 20 when I was there. And uh, uh, oddly enough, uh, although I had a really good reputation for being a good uh, field soldier, uh, train, this is in training, training environment, um, I wasn't a very good garrison soldier. Uh, used to get in a lot of fights and, and things like that, and got a couple Article 15s, and the uh, uh, strange thing is I was actually uh, originally discharged with a general discharge under honorable conditions. Uh, that never really sat well with me, so uh, when I got out of uh, the Army at Fort Drum, I uh, immediately set out the rest of my life to prove, get some kind of honor back. Uh, immediately became an EMT and a paramedic and did that for work in EMS, emergency room ambulance for about 10 years. But um, uh, fast forward uh, uh, 10 years, I got out of the Ar Army in 91, 9-11 happened in 2001. By that time I was 30, 31 years old, fat, out of shape, didn't think I could uh, really have anything to contribute to what I knew was about to become something really big. Um, so in 2003, uh, I went and tried to uh, uh, get back in regular army, and I was pretty much laughed out of the uh, out of the recruiting office. Uh, they said, uh, uh, you know, I want to try the army reserve, so I did. I uh, pretty much laughed out of that office, and they said, well, why don't you try the National Guard? Uh, so I did. 
and uh, uh, they were willing to take me, but uh, at that time I weighed like 270 pounds, a big, big guy. I had to take the ASVAB test all over again. Uh, by this time I'd been out of the Army for 13 years, so I went and took the ASVAB and uh, uh, aced it again the se second time. First time was when I was, you know, 17 years old. Uh, next time I'm like 32, 33 taking it. And I said, you gotta lose some weight. So I spent uh, uh, eight or nine months uh, just working really hard to lose a lot of weight, and road marching, doing PT and things like that. And got down about 245 and they said, all right, well, we'll let you in, contingent upon you, know, you continue to lose weight. So they signed me up uh, and I was uh, actually, uh, by December 2003, I had enlisted uh, into the Texas Army National Guard and I uh, uh, was pretty sure I'd end up in Iraq, but I, at the back of my mind, I never really thought it would happen. But uh, sure enough, in uh, August of, of uh, actually May of, of, of 2004, we were stop lost, which was fine. I, you know, I, I uh, volunteered for that. Uh, and then August of of 04, we were uh, activated and went to Fort Bra uh, Fort Hood for a five to six month train up, uh, where we were there. Uh, the entire 56 brigade combat teams, about 4,500 of us, were at uh, Fort Hood just doing all kinds of training, which. In hindsight, it had absolutely nothing to do with what we did in Iraq. Um, my MOS uh, from day from the time I joined the Army in '89 until this day uh, is 11 Bravo. It's never been anything but 11 Bravo. Um, but I enlisted in the National Guard to be a medic. I figured, you know, what what can I do to contribute? I'm I'm old, you know, I'm fat. What can I do? Uh, well, I was a pretty good paramedic. Uh, so I was supposed to be a medic, uh, however, uh, that didn't work out. So here I am, I'm in a tanker battalion, and uh, I'm not a tanker. Um, so the closest thing that they had to, for me to go to was the uh, mortar platoon in HHC, uh, which is 11 Charlies, their infantry as well, uh, but I had no mortar training or anything like that. Um, that's where I stayed uh, the entire time. Uh, we most of our training up at Fort Hood was all on mortar systems, and uh, uh, to be perfectly honest, with you, I hated it. Um, but in hindsight, those are still my best friends now to this day. Um, but what ended up happening was uh, when we got to Iraq. Uh, we left in uh, early January of 05, uh, landed in Kuwait, and still just trying to get everything together. Brigade was, you know, who's going to do what, where, when. Well, my battalion was the uh, second of the 112th, uh, and they decided to take my battalion, remove us from the rest of the brigade, and put us at uh, Al Takadam, uh, which is about six miles west of Fallujah. Uh, in 05, which is an extremely bloody year uh, in Iraq, uh, the very southern portion of the Al Anbar province. And our job, my battalion's task, was called force protection. Uh, that basically means that uh, some companies are going to be assigned to watching the gate, some are going to be assigned to watching the perimeter, and uh, two platoons out of the entire battalion of the 2nd of the 112th, that would be the 19 Delta Scout Platoon and the, uh, what we now called, uh, it was the Mortar Platoon, but we called it the Infantry Platoon because we were just a mix of 11 Charlies and 11 Bravos and, uh, and we, we didn't do anything having to do with mortars, uh, we did grunt work. Uh, two platoons were assigned to leave the wire uh, the entire year and conduct operations and that's what we did uh, from the time we hit the ground there until uh, until the time we left uh, going out and you know, first it started off with uh, you know, handing out food and soccer balls and 
toys and things like that. And to a lot of the guys, it was kind of like a big joke because nothing really bad had happened for a while. Um, except for uh, when we weren't on mission uh, back in the tents, we lived in tents. Um, we would take indirect fire, sometimes nightly for weeks. Uh, but we really hadn't run anything outside the wire for a few months. Um, and then uh, May 22nd, 2005, that pretty much changed. Uh, I was on uh, QRF, the Quick Reaction Force, that day. Uh, well, one half of our platoon would go out and do missions, the other half would stay behind and do QRF. Um, my platoon was, was uh, just hit by an IED and, and uh, I was on QRF, so I responded with the QRF team out there, and, and uh, we had a guy seriously injured with medevaced out. Uh, his name is William Nakaza, uh, and the vehicle was just torn up. Uh, but other than that, it was somewhat okay. This was on a very dangerous road called Route Michigan. Uh, Route Michigan is the main highway that runs east and west all the way through uh, Iraq. Uh, and uh, sometimes you'll hear about another road called Route Tampa. It's the one that runs north and south all the way through Iraq. Never been on Tampa, but been on Michigan several times. Exactly 72 hours after that, uh, May 25th, about 8.15 a.m., uh, I was on uh, patrol uh, and probably... Uh, uh, two, three miles uh, after we pulled out of the ECP, out of the entry control point, the gate, uh, uh, we were actually on our way to do a, a route clearing operation. We were on our way to a certain section. Uh, we had uh, bomb sniffing dogs. Uh, the Marine Corps uh, provided us with uh, uh, bomb sniffing dogs and things like that. And uh, that's when my vehicle was hit, and it was, uh, it was actually a, an, a, the IED was initiated for an ambush. So uh, uh, when my uh, vehicle uh, got hit, uh, the rest of the vehicles, we'd, have, we'd go out in four, four vehicles, four gun trucks, uh, did their job, you know, uh, got off the road, started looking for the trigger man, and uh, I was driving that day. So we would switch out. Sometimes I would gun, sometimes I would drive. And my gunner, uh, Jeremy Lee, um, as soon as we were hit, it, uh, there was no sound. We didn't hear anything. Um, it just sounded like a clap. And all of a sudden the whole world just went gray on the outside and on the inside of the vehicle. All the dust and dirt on the inside was just up in the air. And couldn't see, we were coughing, and uh, it was me driving, um, Staff Sergeant Rogers as TC. Behind him was uh, uh, Lance Corporal uh, Jimmy Stewart, he was a Marine. Uh, behind me was uh, one of our uh, interpreters, uh, uh, one of our uh, Arabic interpreters. Uh, we just called him Mo, they went by nicknames. And in the middle of the Humvee, uh, while Jeremy was sitting you know, in the gunner sling, he was straddling a big German Shepherd. And German Shepherd was a bomb sniffing dog. His name was Hans. And uh, uh, we all got shook really fast. Uh, but uh, uh, seemed, seemed OK for a second. So I slammed on the brakes. And while my TC was telling me to push forward and keep going, um, you know, I decided to uh, no uh, because uh, I was taught by Ranger Santa 13 years before when you're in an ambush, you turn and you fight. And uh, that's a good, was a good call on my part, I guess, because uh, there was a secondary IED waiting for us about uh, 15 meters in, uh, down the road. So the uh, first one tore us up pretty good. The second one would have killed all of us. But... Um, and this all happened in a matter of seconds, but slam on the brakes, and we all did body checks to make sure we still had our parts and everything. And, and all of a sudden, I heard Jeremy Lee. He's in the gunner's hatch. I see his lower half of his body, and I hear him uh, 
uh, kind of like moaning in pain, and I'm, I'm hoping to God he's joking, um, but uh, uh, he's not, you know, and all of a sudden he said, my arm, and then uh, his whole body just went limp right there uh, in the uh, strap, and uh, I could see, you know, we all had our body armor on, and, and we're all decked out in all of our gear, and I could see blood pooling, just starting to really fast come down the side of his body and just start to you know, drip on, on the floor, probably 10 seconds or whatever, for that to happen. And I was like, oh man, this is a, this is a real deal. So uh, uh, even though I was, I was a, a, a PFC, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, got out of the army the first time as a private and uh, in 91, they, they don't give you rank just because you get older. So uh, when I went back in the, in the National Guard, I was still private, um, but had a few years behind me, uh, and uh, especially working uh, EMS scenes. So I basically had to take control because uh, a lot of people were panicking uh, in my vehicle. And uh, while the other vehicles were doing their jobs, uh, this is something I knew. I mean, it's something I'd done before as far as uh, working at EMS. I'd just never been in an explosion before. And uh, so, long story short, um, I was able to get uh, uh, Jeremy. It was very difficult because he was heavy. A big, strong, very muscular guy, all muscle, and just dead weight. So uh, um, I directed uh, the other guys in the vehicle uh, to uh, basically just pull guard. Um, the vehicle behind us had quickly pulled up behind us, dropped off the medic. And so me and the medic, uh, uh, well, medic handed me his big, his big knife and uh, I actually ended up cutting the strap and Jeremy you know, had to fall to the ground. I couldn't really hold him with one arm and we got him out. and. Uh, Cut his body armor off, but while we were while we were working on Jeremy to keep him alive, uh, you know, our other guys were uh, were doing what they had to do, and I could hear some gunfighting going on to the north. I knew which vehicle it was; it was a good friend of mine uh, in there. Uh, but I had to focus on taking care of uh, 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 Jeremy. And once we cut his body armor off, cut his shirt off, he had a big hole uh, right here, and. Uh, uh, for some reason, he was still breathing barely, um, and so we picked him up. I looked for an exit wound, and there wasn't one, which I just didn't understand because it was such a big, bloody hole, uh, just causing blood everywhere. Blood all over me, blood all over Doc Spivey, and uh, tried to start an IV line, but his, his veins were collapsed, so he couldn't get one. So he just put a bunch of pressure, uh, another uh, Humvee pulled up, we ended up loading him up on uh, on that vehicle and they ground medevaced him back to uh, Camp Altacatum where we were at. Uh, we had a surgical team there and that was the last time I saw Jeremy uh, uh, for until about a year later. He, he actually, he, he clinically died several times um, but he actually did live and uh, his a uh, his arm is all shriveled up, you know, to this day like this, he can't use it, but uh, he did get married and had two kids and doing really well. Um, but after Jeremy was uh, carted away, uh, QRF had arrived, uh, so we were kind of backed up there. We had some backup, and then uh, I was uh, attached to, uh, well, I was tasked I had to take uh, my interpreter and another interpreter that showed up with QRF. It was just us three. We had to walk about 800 meters uh, to the uh, east, where the eastern, our uh, QRF had set up an eastern block uh, blockade there to stop traffic. And uh, I had to go over there and uh, uh, hook up with those guys. And I'm carrying, you know, Jeremy's rucksack on top of my rucksack and uh, my M4, I slung it uh, and I took Jeremy's saw, the M249, and, uh, and went and linked up with those guys and 
there we conducted some uh, some raids of some houses that were close by, and uh, of course they uh, didn't see anything, didn't know anything. Um, oddly enough, though, the uh, the family or families of the two houses that were over there, they had segregated all the women and children, put them into one house, and all the men in the other house, because uh, they obviously knew we were coming, and uh, nothing fruitful happened out of that, but, uh, um, you know, you live and you learn. Um, took us another three months to find out where the weapons cache was, cache was. Or, uh, happened to be at the local house, the house of the, of the local sheik, or the mayor of a town uh, that we've been doing business with for the past eight months, and uh, right there at his house. I mean, bombs and detonators and very nice sniper rifles uh, and uh, uh, night vision equipment and things like that. Uh, you know, somebody we should have searched uh, when we first got there, but uh, we didn't. But uh, other than that day, uh, you know, we had uh, just, uh, you know, Months of months of boredom and, and, and hours of, of terror, I mean, over the year. I mean, it's not like a D-Day invasion or anything like that. I mean, it's just a lot of boredom and then uh, several weeks of incoming fire. Uh, they had modified, uh, they, sometimes you hear the word Haji thrown around, you know, Haji this, Haji that, but Haji is just a term. It's just an overall term for anybody who makes a pilgrimage to Mecca called a Hajj. So you say Haji. But the actual bad guys, we have we have our nickname for them. We call them uh, Mujahs, you know. Uh, Muj is short for uh, Mujahideen, you know, which means holy soldier, holy warrior. So uh, our, our intent wasn't to rough up Hajis, you know, it was to rough up Mujahs, you know. So. And uh, I'd say overall we we gave as good as we got, but uh, I don't know. I think we probably, uh, in my opinion, at least uh, <laughs> uh, took some took some pretty hard beatings uh, just throughout the year. I mean, they always had the advantage. Uh, the uh, the insurgents there always had the advantage. I mean, they knew everything about us where we were, when we were, what we were doing. And we rarely knew anything about them. So, uh, there was a lot of, a lot of politics on our side. Uh, you know, the, the bravest people there were, on our side were, you know, E6s and below. Uh, it seemed that way, with the exception of one of my own personal heroes, his name was Lieutenant Rodney Kelly. He was my platoon leader at the time of, uh, of my ambush, at least on May 25th. Uh, he was fantastic, but uh, I don't know. There seemed to be a lot of uh, uh, a lot of times when when the higher ups wanted to go do things just to uh, serve no purpose. Uh, we would. Occasionally, uh, I, I believe ten times, maybe twelve times throughout that year, we would we would do something uh, that, and everybody, a lot of people all over Iraq used this terminology, but we used it uh, in a specific way for ourselves. We we call it the a thunder run, and basically what that was was to load up vehicles and drive from Al Takadam to Camp Fallujah, which was six miles or so to the uh, to the east of us, uh, down Route Michigan, and uh, just to see if you could do it without getting blown up. And there was no point. I mean, there was uh, we weren't transporting anything, you know, anything or people or anything like that. Uh, it was just to see uh, if it could be done. And uh, I had a problem with that, a really big problem with that. But uh, and it was a chance for 
uh, you know, brass to leave the wire, and uh, you know, and, and and we used to call them uh, Purple Heart Hunters, or uh, or in some cases uh, they have this new combat action badge called the CAB. We call them CAB Hunters, or you know, Bronze Star Hunters, uh, and we, there was a lot of that throughout the entire year. A lot of what I what I call uh, ticket punching for uh, uh, a lot of people. Not not all officers, uh, but some of them are pretty good. But there are ones that seem like uh, we'd get volunteers from time to time to go out with us to leave the wire, and very rarely did they ever go twice. You know, uh, so go out some, you know, or at least until something happened, you know, and come back and go back to whatever their uh, rent job was, you know. Uh, I probably shouldn't spell out what the word rent means, but uh, it's not a nice thing to say. But uh, after I got back uh, December of uh, Oh, five. We were there for just under 12 months, 11, 11 and a half months. Uh, I had uh, changed from the person that I was to the person I am now. Uh, before I, you know, I went to Iraq, I was a, uh, a devout uh, uh, and very disciplined uh, uh, Messianic Jew. and. Uh, and raised my family as such, uh, but after I got back, I just uh, uh, changed. So uh, I've been uh, kind of just like this other person for, I don't know, four or five years now. Uh, but uh, in and out of uh, PTSD therapy, I, uh, the uh, VA, I just decided what the heck I'll I'll, I'll go check it out and go talk to one of their shrinks and see what happens. And I mean, they just, I mean, all I, all I do is tell them the truth and they just rubber stamp me. This guy's nuts. So they, uh, they uh, basically gave me a 100% disability just based on what I told them. And um, so I've been uh, getting disability for that and going to various treatments. Uh, through the VA, sometimes not through the VA. Uh, uh, as of now, up until now, they've been treating it as PTSD, but I, I just had a hard time with that. I, I think it's uh, something more. I think I, I think I got my, my my noodle knocked pretty hard. Uh, so just last week, I just got an MRI of my brain, and it'll be uh, interpreted uh, next week. So maybe they'll find some kind of a traumatic brain injury or something along those lines and we can start uh, treatment from there, from that angle. That's pretty much the summary I can think of right now. <laughs> That's fine. But mm -hmm. Milton and I have done over 40 of these. And it's tough to listen to your story. It must be even tougher to tell it. And I say that as a compliment. You've, uh, we thank you for being here this morning, and we thank you for your service, because you've done a lot. Now, with that little spiel on my part, let me go back and ask this questions here. You went to Fort Drum in 89. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Born in Dallas, grew up in Texas. So what did, what time of the year did you go to Fort Drum? Oh, man. Or were you there through the winter, I guess is really my question. Two winters. Um, was that a little bit of a shock to you? It was, uh, well, before Iraq, it would be the hardest thing I ever did. I got off the bus uh, at, at, at Fort Drum in, uh, I think it was uh, uh, July 
or August of 89, it was 95 degrees. And I was like, this isn't so bad. <laughs> and uh, Corporal, uh, Corporal Olson became my team leader. Uh, first thing, he got on the bus and we got off. And the first thing he said was, you ever been cold? And I was like, yeah. And he's like, no, you haven't. And uh, in December of 1989, we were doing what's called platoon evaluations. And, uh, and I, I'm not joking, R Ranger Santa, uh, Santa Seri, he lives down near Austin, Texas now. He's, he's actually from Brooklyn, New York. And ended up retiring as a sergeant major and uh, moving down here to Texas. And uh, he will even, he corrected me actually. We went and had dinner a few years ago and I, and I, was, I was telling him, yeah, I remember the platoon of ours in 89, December of 89. I said it was negative 50, and he corrected me. He said it was negative 60, and we were out there with it was just just the worst thing. And it was, in fact, it was so cold they had to index the training mission, and nobody could come and get us out. No flights, no vehicles, nothing. It was that cold, so we had to keep ourselves uh, alive. And we were out in it for three days. Uh, that's the coldest I'd ever been. Uh, oddly enough, I would find myself. Uh, in Iraq where you often hear people say uh, what well, was 130 degrees. Um, 130 degrees is an average day between uh, the months of, of May and September. That's an average day. An average night is 100 and uh, rarely drop below 110 at night. Um, but many times it got to 140 and 150 um, and the only reason we can gauge that is because uh, body armor adds 10 degrees uh, and in a vehicle with no uh, air conditioning you can you can just keep going and keep going so I mean it could have been as high as 160 at times so uh, I, I've been in the coldest of the cold and the hottest of the hot and <clears throat> survived it but yeah Fort, Fort Drum was very cold I went through two winters there and yeah weapons froze up on our it was yeah, <laughs> very, very hard. Somewhere after Drum, and then you went to Fort Bragg or, or Benning down there somewhere, but you made the comment you spent some time in Scotland. Mm -hmm. The Brits' way of doing things was different. You liked it. Oh, yeah. But they, uh, were, these, were, these, were they British or Scottish, or, or did it make any difference? Well, the army over there is, uh, n number one, the Brits, or I'll just say the, the English in general don't care for the Scots, and the Scots don't care for the English, uh, and they both hate the Irish. Uh, and they're just, but they're funny people. But the actual army, uh, even though Scotland is its own sort of territory, uh, it's still part of the UK, and so the army is still the the the, uh, the British army. Uh, so you can be a, a Scot, but when you join the army, you're joining the British army. Um, and you can be you can be English and stationed in Scotland. You can be Scotland stationed in England. Um, so it was technically the British army, but uh, we had a lot of Scots and, and Brits. Uh, and the tactics are it's the same army, so same. Same tactics, uh, but uh, their 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 version of of uh, urban combat. Uh, the army we in the army we call it mount uh, military operations on urban terrain. In uh, in England they call it uh, fibia, and it's a strange acronym. It's a F I B U A. You would think it would be fibua, but they call it fibia, and that means uh, fighting in built up areas. And uh, when it comes to uh, uh, being on the defense, in other words, fortifying a, a house, or fortifying buildings, uh, they were brutal. I mean, we learned some really cool things from them. Uh, you know, I mean, we thought we knew how to, you know, turn a, a home into a fortress, uh, but uh, I mean, they had they had razor blades in the walls, you know, <laughs> uh, there, uh, and they'd make little uh, little choke points, you know, through the hallways where, uh, boy, if, if you were going to go through those hallways, you were going to pay, you know. Uh, and they would booby trap uh, uh, various stairs, and obviously not with real grenades, but with like uh, little, we called them little toe poppers. But basically, you stepped on it and made a pop, so you knew you were blowing up. But uh, that's where we learned to, uh, when you negotiate a stairway, 
uh, if you have to go. Uh, technically, you always want to salt the building top down, but sometimes you have to go in the bottom and walk your way up. And that's where we learned that you don't have time to sit there and check every step. So in order to keep from blowing up, uh, you, uh, if you take every other step, if you skip a step every, every time, uh, you've reduced your chances by 50%. You take every third step, you've reduced it by 75 percent. You know, you can still hit one, but that's pretty much uh, how we did it. And uh, we used their weapons, the ones they st they still use today. They use, uh, if you ever see any footage of them, you know, their their rifles. Uh, they're called SA-80s, and uh, uh, their magazine wells are behind the trigger, and uh, they're neat. They're neat rifles. Uh, we use their all their weapons and all their equipment, and uh, and. Uh, trained by their guys. They had some SAS guys come out and give us some pretty good training. So yeah, it's a lot of fun. Uh, <clears throat> when you got out, uh, first time, Article 15. <laughs> what is an Article? Or you'd rather not say. Um, no, it's fine. Uh, no, it's, uh, Article 15 is basically, uh, uh, it's kind of like uh, in the civilian world, uh, you have different kinds of misdemeanors. You have Class A, Class B, Class C, at least here in Texas. Um, Article 15 is in your Army. You can have uh, 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 summarized Article 15s or company. I believe it's company grade Article 15s. Summarized Article 15s. Um, our little punishments for doing various things that that uh, if you stay in the army uh, when you transfer to another army if you re-enlist and go to another army post the summarized article 15s are not supposed to follow you the company grade article 15s do I, I got five summarized article 15s and two company grades and uh, um, basically it was for fighting drinking underage uh, uh, Salted an NCO, <laughs> but uh, um, twi twice actually, uh, and and so the, the five summaries uh, weren't too much of a big deal, but the two company grades were, and by uh, by that time they had decided, well, we're just going to go ahead and ask you to leave, you know, um, which is understandable. You were a disciplinary problem. Yeah, well, not not in the field. We spent a lot of time in the field. So in the field, I'm most I flourished, but back then Fort Drum was a very lonely place. I mean, there was nothing around it to do, and uh, now I hear it's just huge, you know, and all kinds of things to do. But back then, it was just a, a really lonely place to be if you were a single soldier. So as long as they kept you in the field and kept you busy, you were yeah a good soldier. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, you were an EMS for a number of years. Where? Uh, Back here, Texas? Yeah, here, here at home. Okay. Did that uh, for, for about eight, eight, nine years. You went back to enlist regular army and in the reserve, you turned down, and I'm assuming it was because you were so far out of shape, you were mm -hmm. up. Yeah. That was the basic reason. You said they, they laughed you out of the office. And, 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 away, and old, I know it. Old is a relative term, but in the infantry, uh, 30 is ancient, you know. Uh, and, that, and so that's what I, in order to re-enlist, they, you know, they, they're they like, yeah, you, you're going to be an infantry soldier? I'm like, well, no, I'd like to be a medic. But anyway, they, yeah, no, I, I just like, no, nah, man, you're, I mean, they were somewhat nice about it, but, uh, but they did. They you did. got the message. Yeah. We go to May the 25th of 05, right? Mm -hmm. What sort of vehicle were you with? I was in a very uh, poorly up armored uh, Humvee. Um, one that had the, the armor attached when you were. No, ones we, yeah, yeah, yeah one, ones we attached. <laughs> ones we, we uh, you just welded. As a unit, you would have salvage whatever and just weld plates. In the beginning, yeah, in the beginning. Later on that year, we did get some uh, properly up armored Humvees, but a little late by that time. But uh, um, in fact, we had just 
that vehicle I was in had just gotten uh, a rear shield for the gunner. I mean, there were, there were vehicles there with no shields at all, you know, just a hole, you know, <laughs> and a gun mount. Uh, but we had just gotten uh, some rear shields there. Uh, and oddly enough, the, the shrapnel that hit my friend, uh, had, uh, the IED was to our right. It blew up in this chunk of shrapnel, came in, bounced off the shield, and went through, uh, totally missed his plate. You know, the, the plate here, the sappy plate that was really hard, but went just right through the, uh, the Kevlar part, uh, missed the plate into his chest, and actually ended up, ended up skirting the outside of his, of his uh, rib cage. Didn't penetrate his lungs uh, and lodged right here. And, uh, uh, but what happened was it, it hit a major uh, uh, artery here, not, uh, not the aorta, but whatever the aorta branches off, probably into the brachial system and just bled, I mean, you know, bled out, so all over the place. In this vehicle, you had a mixed crew. You had National Guard folks, you had a Marine, mm -hmm. and you had an interpreter who was an Iraqi or a Saudi or a... I think he might have been a... I think Mo was a Syrian. Syrian? I, I think so. Okay. But it was a mixed crew. Was that normal that you would have mixed services in a... Oh, yeah. It was? Okay. Camp Althacottam is, is, a, is a Marine Corps air base. And uh, you want to talk about irony. Uh, you know, when we first got there, when my battalion first got there, uh, basically I was like, okay, so let me get this straight. The, uh, the Texas National Guard, it's, it's our job to keep the Marines safe. Uh, I, I don't understand that logic at all, but uh, that's what it was. And so we had uh, some of our assets were Marines, and so I, it's very rare that we ever left the wire without at least some Marines with us. Um, our canine handlers were Marines. And our EOD assets were um, uh, were Marines. So whenever we'd go out looking for a go out looking for IEDs, that was a whole different tactic than just going down the road. I mean, when you did a uh, route clearance looking for IEDs, you 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 went really slow, and people dismounted, and you were actually looking very slowly. Do like a reverse V formation, and you know, trying to keep an eye on it, and you know, we found them every single time. Um, but uh, sometimes we'd have a, 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 the bomb sniffing dog with us, a lot of times actually. Um, and then our, whenever we would find them, we'd find an IED. We'd well, first thing we do is run, and <laughs> and then pull a, a 360 security around it for a, about th try to be about 300 meters away, and then the EOD the EOD. The, uh, 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 EOD assets, they were Marines. They would come out, we'd call, they'd come out from Altacottam and, and they were smart, they had a robot and <laughs> they'd get that robot, stick some C4 on it, mm, take it out there, would put the C4 down, robot would come back and they'd blow it in place, you know. So, yeah, we worked very closely with the Marine Corps there, the, uh, the uh, second FSSG uh, of the second Marine Division. So we actually we were we were assigned to them. Uh, comment before we go any farther, we haven't mentioned it, and most of the fellows in your position I think are very humble. But you did win a bronze star for your action that day, hmm. which you have failed to mention. But I think. As part of the record, it's important that we say that. Uh, after this affair, uh, Jeremy Lee is, is evacuated. You had two weapons when, when you and the two interpreters went off to another unit. You had an M4 and a saw. Mm -hmm. Okay. M4, mm -hmm. saw. What are they? M4 is just a shorter M16. It's about this long. Um, most of us had those as our primary weapons, and uh, and the saw is the uh, M249 squad automatic weapon. And uh, it was actually a it's a belt-fed weapon, and it's got a box that connects to the bottom of it. 
but uh, Jeremy's was tricked out and his he had a short barrel on it. It was really cool. And uh, uh, but when he went, you know, his equipment had to be secured, and so I secured it. Uh, and I figured if I'm gonna, you know, open up, I'd rather open up with the, if I have to, I'd rather open up with the saw than, than with the M4. So I slung the M4 and carried the saw as my primary and, uh, and uh, like I said, walked about, I don't know, probably 800 meters east to our, where they were blocking off traffic. Both of these weapons 7.62? No, 5.56, both 5.56. 5.56, five, five, no. okay. Uh, you went back later looking for the the weapons, the, the store of weapons, found them in the house of the Sheik. Yeah, basically next door to his house, not in his house. There was a... Uh, he had knowledge, you there, suspect. No, we, the only ones that suspected that the, that, that the local Sheik, Sheik Nain was his name. The name of his town was, we called it QAJ, but it was uh, Kudiyat al Jifa. Uh, uh, the only one that really suspected uh, uh, him were just a handful of us that were under E5, and we tried to scream to the loud horn, top of our voices up, up, up the chain of command, take this guy out, take this guy out. Nah, I didn't want to do it. And that was, like I said, three months after uh, uh, our, uh, our ambush, two ambushes on our platoon. Um, and again, a total of eight months after we landed in country, so. Uh, when you went looking for these bad guys, you had Hajis and you had Mujas. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a way that you could tell? Is this kind of like Vietnam? You couldn't tell the good guys from the bad guys, and... and how did you differentiate the Hajis from the Mujas? Well, the um, the the Mujas uh, are the ones generally uh, shooting at you or remote detonating the bombs, and so very very hard to distinguish. But the uh, uh, we ac we actually had uh, bomb testing residue kits. And so, at our uh, just just uh, our our daily uh, some of our daily missions were to do vehicle checkpoints where we just stop stop traffic and just check vehicles randomly and people. We use these kits, and uh, uh, I didn't usually administer the tests uh, uh, myself. Usually, I was on a gun, uh, you know, either in the gunner's turret or, or, or driving um, or pulling security. But I think it turned the hands. Uh, blue or whatever, which indicated they were around bomb-making material. But then, all of a sudden, you know, the story was everybody was a farmer. Oh, I'm a farmer, so that's why you know, I work with fertilizer, and that's why, so, you know. And, of course, our chain of command bought it, and so we did a lot of catch and release. We did an awful lot of catch and release that year, you know. Uh, thunder runs. <laughs> Who... Was this uh, was a thunder run the the decision to make a thunder run? Was this at battalion level or? Uh, it was. Uh, it, it, was it was obviously above platoon and above company. I yeah. suspect. Yeah, it was uh, at the lowest battalion level. I, I only know of one or two that were actually uh, at the uh, the level of uh, I guess you'd call it. Uh, I don't know if you call it. I'm trying to think of the Marine Corps hierarchy, really, but uh, uh, sometimes it was higher than battalion. Uh, but uh, there were, uh, in my, well, in my, we never got a clear answer on exactly who was making the call, but we, we kind of knew who the, uh, who the glory hounds were. So, and, uh, and on, on the, speaking of the glory hounds and, the Bronze Star, I mean, uh, out of a, apparently, and I don't know what the number is, but apparently, uh, if you're a brigade commander and you have a brigade, there are only so many Bronze Stars that you can issue to the people underneath you. Um, out of a battalion of us, uh, I think there were probably 500 and 
50 all together, somewhere in there for the battalion. Um, uh, only three of us uh, were awarded, the best of my knowledge, the Bronze Star for a, for your valor or a valorous valor reason, um, uh, which means that uh, that everybody else, and there were, I mean, people were just given bronze stars, not people, uh, you know, uh, 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 every every company commander, most lieutenants, most platoon sergeants, uh, just given, just given, just for being there, just for uh, you know, uh, then I'd say 80 percent, 85 percent of them were given to people that never left the wire. So uh, uh, what that means is, is that I personally know uh, a lot of really good soldiers that deserve bronze stars and maybe even silver stars, uh, but uh, that uh, didn't get them simply because uh, they were wasted on a lot of people. So Application. that's why I don't, you know go around, you know, bronze star this and bronze star that because it just it's it's devalued when it's just given away to so many people and then there's so many other good people that really deserved them. So one last question mm -hmm. if I could, sir. Mm -hmm. Your uh, treatment by the VA. Do they do a good job? Good job with the resources at hand? Do you are, are you satisfied? Are they taking you in the right direction? Um, there's a lot of good positive changes, and uh, and uh, there's a lot of good people uh, that, that that work in the system. But uh, uh, it hasn't uh, been as helpful as I would have liked it to have been. So uh, I'm I'm actually doing treatment on my own, going on my own my own way to uh, to get. Treatment. So, you employed currently? No, no, sir. No, I don't. Uh, I don't do well in crowds, so. <laughs> so I uh, just kind of stick to myself and do my own thing. You bet, sir. Well, we appreciate you coming by this morning, telling us the story, and, and we certainly appreciate the time that you've spent there uh, defending us. You bet. It's good to meet you, sir. Thank, Thank you. you.